Welcome to Creolicious Presents Haiti History 101 King of Haiti The Rise and Fall of Henri Christophe Part 2 In mid-1807, Henri Christophe is involved in a war with former ally Alexandre Pétion for control of Haiti. Christophe gathers an army of about 10,000 against Pétion's 3,000 and the two fight at Cibert, not too far from Port-au-Prince. Christophe's army defeats Pétion, and according to the historian, Bobouan Ardouin had one of Pétion's soldiers not disguised himself in Pétion's gold-laced hat and been shot in his place. Pétion would have been killed during the battle. Christophe lay siege in Port-au-Prince for eight days, after which he heads to northern Haiti, where he proclaims himself chief ruler. Pétion rules over a republic in the south. Christophe draws a constitution in February 1807 that declares Roman Catholicism as the official religion of Haiti, though other religions would be tolerated. All males from age 16 to 50 are required to enroll in the army. Four years after he begun ruling the North as president, Christophe proclaims himself king. Christophe has teachers brought in from England and institute a pro-English curriculum. He sets up several schools, including a royal school of music, an art school, and a science school. Though he was illiterate, the king has a royal library consisting of 25,000 books, a collection unheard of at that time. Christophe creates Code Henri, a collection of laws under which his territories were to be governed. Under Christophe's rule, northern Haiti thrives, especially in regards to agriculture and the arts. This is a copy of an opera that was created by Count Rosier, one of the nobles of King Henri's royal court. Christophe is very hostile to the French, but embraces the British. Besides having teachers brought in from England to train Haitian teachers, the king's very own personal physicians were British and Scottish. According to the historian Justin Placide, Christophe inserts a special clause in his constitution to get the support of England. He promises that his government will not interfere with the slaves of other nations. To show his goodwill towards England, Christophe reveals a slave uprising plot involving Haitians in the South are concocting with slaves in Jamaica. Christophe develops a friendship with noted British abolitionists William Wilberforce and Thomas Clarkson, both of whom would support Christophe's establishing English modeled education in Haiti. But the British aren't Henri's only friends. He forms a friendship with Prince Saunders, an African-American intellectual who speaks favorably of Haiti in the United States and uses the country as proof that black people could successfully come out of slavery and rule themselves. Saunders encourages black Americans to move to Haiti, and he himself does. He later becomes one of King Henri Christophe's advisors. On June 2nd, 1811, Henri Christophe's actual coronation takes place. Taking the name King Henri I, Christophe changes the French I into the British version of Henry with a Y. Christophe has a grand banquet at Fort Liberté, while a horseman gallops through the town proclaiming Vive la Roi. The following day, Christophe creates a nobility that included eight dukes, 22 counts, two princes, 35 barons, 14 knights, not to mention countesses and duchesses. King Henri's etiquette for his royal court is quite strict, including the dress code. The Kingdom of Haiti has its own currency, its own coat of arms. The king has a printing press that publishes La Almanac Royal, or the Royal Almanac, the official newspaper of the Kingdom of Haiti. The printing press is used to write propaganda against Alexandre Pétion, Christophe's nemesis. It is also used to retaliate against white supremacists 
who the king and his nobles feel are slandering the newly freed Haiti throughout Europe and the Americas. King Henri has 10 palaces built all over his kingdom, including the San Suchi Palace, his kingly residence. Queen Marie Louise hosts several parties there. The historian Williams Wells Brown describes the San Suchi Palace this way. The halls and saloons of the palace were wrought with mahogany. The floors were laid with rich marble, and numerous high fountains furnished coolness and a supply of pure water to the different apartments. Christophe held a levy on the Thursday evening of each week, which was attended by the most fashionable of all classes, including the foreign ambassadors and consuls. But the building that was to take people's breath away was Citadel Henri, later to be called La Citadelle La Ferrière a mammoth fortress that King Henri Christophe has built on the tip of a mountain. Construction had begun while Dessalines still ruled, but Christophe completed it. The fortress had wells, dungeons, food storage houses, 365 cannons, bullets, and cannon balls. It even had a smaller fortress called Rémiere. Christophe had La Citadelle built in case the French decided to come back and the food depot were in there just in case they had to ward off an attack from France. At this point, the idea of a French invasion didn't seem so far-fetched. French King Louis XVIII, still wanting to restore Haiti as a French territory, sent off a series of envoys to Haiti. Through these representatives, Louis offered Christophe royal titles and in return, Christophe was to allow the French to recuperate their former colony. Christophe refused outright and even had one of the French envoys executed. Christophe scoffed at the idea of playing second fiddle to France when it came to recognizing Haiti's independence as a nation. According to the historian Jacques-Nicolas Léger, he made this proclamation. Nous ne traiterons avec le gouvernement français que sur le même pied de puissance à puissance de souverain à souverain. Aucune négociation ne sera entamée par nous avec cette puissance qui n'aurait pour base préalable l'indépendance du royaume d'Haïti tant en matière de gouvernement que de commerce. Le pavillon français ne sera admis dans aucun des ports du royaume ni aucun individu de cette nation jusqu'à ce que l'indépendance d'Haïti soit définitivement reconnue par le gouvernement français. We will negotiate with the French government on equal footing, from power to power, from sovereign to sovereign. No negotiation will be entered upon with that country unless the independence of the Kingdom of Haiti, political as well as commercial, be previously recognized. Neither the French flag nor any Frenchman will be allowed to enter any port of the kingdom until the French government positively recognizes the independence of Haiti. While King Henri makes his hostility towards the French plain, he doesn't forget about another enemy. The historian Sin Remy states that in March of 1812, King Henri Christophe takes advantage of Pétion's trip to Okai to renew the war with him. The king launched an attack on Port-au-Prince and overwhelms the forces of southern Haiti, commanded by Jean-Pierre Beauvoyer. Christophe lays siege in Port-au-Prince for three months, while King Henri goes off to Saint-Marc to see the queen. Two of Christophe's main generals join Pétion's side. Christophe quickly returns to Port-au-Prince and ends the siege, fearing that the rest of his army would join Pétion in the south. The historian Sin Rami states that upon his return to his territory, King Henri had anyone he suspected of having sympathies with Pétion executed. Even sighing could cost a subject of King Henri's kingdom his or her life. In March of 1818, Alexandre Pétion dies. Although King Henri makes a proclamation for the South to rally under his rule, Pétion's army chief, Jean-Pierre Boyer, succeeds Pétion as the ruler of the South. Thomas Clarkson, King Henry's old friend, cautions him about feuding with Boyer and indicates that an open rift between the king and Pétion's successor would further divide Haiti and make it vulnerable to a European power takeover. In a letter Clarkson wrote to Haiti's king, 
the British supporter of Haiti warned. If there should ever be unhappily a quarrel between your majesty and Boya, it is supposed that the French would interfere by sending an armed force to Haiti. They have their eyes constantly upon Haiti with that intention, and I believe they indulge the hope of being able to realize it one day or other. This hope is founded on the hatred which is said to subsist between your majesty and General Boya. In case of an open rupture, they would undoubtedly assist General Boya with as large as a naval and military force as they could collect. For it is my duty not to conceal from you that the French cabinet are far better disposed towards General Boya than yourself. Meanwhile, King Henri does not give up hope of expanding his dominion. He contracts agents in England to begin negotiations of the purchase of the Spanish part of Hispaniola, modern-day Dominican Republic, from Spain. But King Henri is to suffer a personal setback. On August 15, 1820, while attending Mass at church, the monarch suffers an apoplexy attack that would leave him bedbound and paralyzed. In saint Marc, the king's subjects rise up against him. King Henri sends off his army to crush the rebellion, but members of the army join the rebels. Meanwhile, Jean-Pierre Boyer marches towards Capetian and is joined by supporters in saint Marc, who are eager to do away with the monarchy. The historian saint Remy states that Christophe wanted to be taken to Citadel Henri, but as the majority of his subjects desert him and mounting his horse proved to be impossible, he resigns himself to remain in his palace. On October 8, 1820, he called Her Majesty, the Queen, and the Princesses, and embraced them. He proceeds to lock himself in his royal chambers. By 7.30 p.m., King Henri Christophe lay dead from a bullet at his own hand. Fearing that his enemies would mutilate his body, the Queen has it carried to Citadel La Ferriere for burial. The King's palaces are looted and his son, Prince Victor Henri Christophe, as well as a few who remain loyal to Christophe, are imprisoned and later put to death. Christophe's negotiations to purchase the Spanish part of Hispaniola to add to his kingdom end with his demise. Jean-Pierre Boyer reunites northern and southern Haiti and places the queen and her daughters under his protection. Less than a year later, the queen and princesses leave for Europe to according to the historian Charles de Pierre, claimed millions in gold fortunes stacked away by Christophe in England. Several decades following his death, Christophe would become the subject of many books and even plays. In the 1970s, producers even considered bringing the story of his reign to the big screen, though these projects never materialized. King Henri's palaces and forts, a subject of considerable curiosity and fascination would draw visitors both local and foreign. This is a photograph of Christophe's punishment tree taken in the 20th century by a visitor. As the name indicates, it's the spot where he would take members of his kingdom for chastisement. The memories of King Henri Christophe and his reign can never be erased thanks to the presence of La Citadelle, La Ferriere, his mammoth fortress, and his palatial wonders. Through these magnificent palaces and architectural tour de force, King Henri Christophe lives. This has been another edition of Haiti History 101. Check out the channel for other episodes. Follow Creolicious on Twitter and Facebook. And be sure to visit the website creolicious.com to learn more about Haitian music, culture, and history. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel so that you will never miss an episode.